Part Three, Chapter Thirteen of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In prison, Anthony found several friends in the Clink prison in Southwark, whither he was brought up from Stanfield Place after his arrest. Life there was very strange a combination of suffering and extraordinary relaxation he had a tiny cell nine feet by five with one little window high up and for the first month of his imprisonment wore irons at the same time his jailer was so much open to bribery that he always found his door open on sunday morning and was able to shuffle upstairs and say mass in the cell of ralph emerson once the companion of campion and a lay brother in the society of jesus there he met a large number of catholics some of whom he had come across in his travels and he even ministered the sacraments to others who managed to come in from the outside his chief sorrow was that his friend and host had been taken to the counter in wood street it was a month before he heard all that had happened on the night of his arrest and on the previous days he had been separated at once from his friends and although he had heard his guards talking both in the hall where he had been kept the rest of the night and during the long hot ride to london the next day yet at first he was so bewildered by mary's death that what they said made little impression on him but after he had been examined both by magistrates and the commissioners and very little evidence was forthcoming his irons were struck off and he was allowed much more liberty than before and at last to his great joy isabel was admitted to see him she herself had come straight up to the merritt's house both of whom still lived on in wharf street though old and infirm and day by day she attempted to get access to her brother until at last by dint of bribery she was successful then she told him the whole story when we left the garden house she said we went straight back and mary found mr graves in the parlor off the hall oh anthony how she ordered him about and how frightened he was of her the end was that he sent a message to the stables for her horses to be got ready as she said i went up with her to help her to make ready and we kissed one another up there for you know we dared not make as if we said good-bye downstairs then we came down for her to mount and then we saw what we had not known before that all the stable yard was filled with the men's horses saddled and bridled however we said nothing except that mary asked a man what what the devil he was looking at when he stared up at her as she stood on the block drawing on her gloves before she mounted there were one or two torches burning in cressets and i saw her so plainly turn the corner down towards the church then i went upstairs again but i could not go to my room but stood at the gallery window outside looking down at the court for i knew that if there was any danger it would come from there then presently i heard a noise and a shouting and a man ran in through the gates to the stable yard and almost directly it seemed three or four rode out at full gallop across the court and down by the church the window was open and i could hear the noise down towards the village then more and more came pouring out and all turned the corner and galloped all but one whose horse slipped and came down with a crash oh anthony how i prayed then i saw mr lackington isabel stopped a moment at the name and then went on again and he was on horseback too in the court but he was shouting to two or three more who were just mounting across the field across the field cut them off i could hear it so plainly and i saw the stable gate was open and they went through and i could hear them galloping on the grass and then i knew what was happening and i went back to my room and shut the door isabel stopped again and anthony took her hand softly in his own and stroked it 
Then she went on. Well, I saw them bring you back from the gallery window, and ran to the top of the stairs, and saw you go through into the hall, where the magistrates were waiting, and the door was shut, and then I went back to my place at the window, and then presently they brought in Mary. I reached the bottom of the stairs just as they set her down, and I told them to bring her upstairs, and they did, and laid her on the bed where we had sat together all the afternoon, and I would let no one in. I did it all myself, and then I set the tapers round her, and put the crucifix that was round my neck into her fingers, which I had laid on her breast, and there she lay on the great bed. Her, her face was like a child's, fast asleep, smiling, and then I kissed her again and whispered, thank you mary for though i did not know all i knew enough and that it was for you anthony had thrown his arms on the table and his face was buried in them isabel put out her hand and stroked his curly head gently as she went on and told him in the same quiet voice of how mary had tried to save him by lashing his horse as she caught sight of the man waiting at the entrance of the field path and riding in between him and Anthony. The man had declared in his panic of fear before the magistrates that he had never dreamed of doing Mistress Corbett an injury, but that she had ridden across just as he drew the trigger to shoot the priest's horse and stop him that way. When Isabel had finished, Anthony still lay with his head on his arms. "'Why, Anthony, my darling,' she said, "'what could be more perfect?' how proud i am of you both she told him too how they had been tracked to stanfield lackington had let it out in his exultation the sailor at greenhithe was one of his agents an apostate like his master he had recognized that the party consisted of catholics by anthony's breaking of the bread he had been placed there to watch the ferry, and had sent messages at once to Nicol and Lackington. Then the party had been followed, but had been lost sight of, thanks to Anthony's ruse. Nicol had then flung out a cordon across the principal roads that bounded Stanstead Woods on the south, and Lackington, when he arrived a few hours later, had kept them there all night. The cordon consisted of idlers and children picked up at Rotham, and the tramp who feigned to be asleep had been one of them. When they had passed, he had given the signal to his nearest neighbor, and had followed them up. Nicol was soon at the place, and after them, and had followed to Stanfield, with Lackington behind. Then watchers had been set round the house. The magistrates communicated with and as soon as hubert and mr graves had arrived the assault had been made hubert had not been told who the priest was but he had leaped at an opportunity to harass mr buxton he had been given to understand that anthony and isabel were still in the north he did not know indeed he did not cried isabel piteously at another time when she had gained admittance to him she gave him messages from the merits who had kept a great affection for the lad who had told them tales of college that christmas time and she told him too of the coming of an old friend to see her there it was poor mr dent she said he looks so old now his wife died three years ago you know he has a city living and does chaplain's work at the tower sometimes and he is coming to see you anthony and talk to you three or four days later he came anthony was greatly touched at his kindness in coming he looked considerably older than his age his hair had grown thin and gray about his temples and the sharp bird-like outline of his face and features seemed blurred and indeterminate his creed, too, and his whole manner of looking at things of faith, seemed to have undergone a similar process. The two had a long talk. "'I am not going to argue with you, Mr. Norris,' he said. 
though I still think your religion wrong. But I have learnt this at least, that the greatest of all is charity, and if we love the same God and his blessed Son and one another, I think that is best of all. I have learnt that from my wife, my dear wife, he added softly, I used to hold much with doctrine at one time, and loved to chop arguments, but our Saviour did not, and so I will not. Anthony was delighted that he took this line, for he knew there are some minds that apparently cannot be loyal to both charity and truth at the same time, and Mr. Dent's seemed to be one of them. So the two talked of old times at Great Keynes, and of the folks there, and at last of Hubert. "'I saw him in the city last week,' said Mr. Dent, "'and he is a changed man. He looks ten years older than this time last year. I scarcely know what has come to him. I know he has thrown up his magistracy.' and the linfield parson tells me that the talk is that mr maxwell is going on another voyage and leaving his wife and children behind him again anthony told him gently of hubert's share in the events at stanfield adding what real and earnest attempts he had made to repair the injury he had done as soon as he had learnt that it was his friend that was in hiding there was no treachery against me mr dent you see he added mr dent pecked a little in the air with pursed lips and eyes fixed on the ground and a vision of the pulpit at great keynes moved before anthony's eyes yes 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 he said i understand i quite understand before mr dent took his leave he unburdened himself of what he had really come to say master anthony he said, standing up and fingering his hat round and round. I said I talked no doctrine now, but I must unsay that, and you will not think me impertinent if I ask you something? My dear Mr. Dent, began the other, standing and smiling too. Thank you, thank you, I felt sure. Then it is this i do not know much about the popish religion though i used to once and i may be very mistaken but i would like you to satisfy me before i go on one point and he fixed his anxious peering eyes on anthony's face can you say master anthony from a full heart that you fix all your hope and confidence for salvation in Christ's merits alone. Anthony smiled frankly in his face. Indeed, in none other, he said, and from a full heart. Oh, well, and the bird-like face began to beam and twitch. And, and there is nothing of confidence in yourself and your works and and there is no talk of holy mary in the matter anthony smiled again he wished to avoid useless controversy briefly he said my belief is that i am a very great sinner that i deserve eternal hell but i humbly place all my trust in the precious blood of my saviour and in that alone does that satisfy you mr dent's face was breaking into smiles and at the end he took the priest's face in his hands and kissed him gently twice on the cheeks then my dear boy i fear nothing for you may that salvation you hope for be yours and then without a word he was gone anthony's conscience reproached him a little that he had said nothing of the church to the minister but mr dent had been so peremptory about doctrine that it was hard for the younger man to say what he would have wished 
He told him, however, plainly on his next visit, that he held wholeheartedly, too, that the Catholic Church was the treasury of grace that Christ had instituted, and added a little speech about his longing to see his old friend a Catholic, too. But Mr. Dent shook his head. The corners of his eyes wrinkled a little, and a shade of his old fretfulness passed over his face. "'Nay, if you talk like that,' he said i must be gone i am no theologian you must let me alone he gave him news this time of mr buxton he is in the counter as you know he said and is a very bright and cheerful person it seems to me mistress isabel asked me to see him and give her news of him for she cannot get admittance he is in a cell little and nasty but he said to me that a protestant prison was a papist pleasance in fact he said it twice and he asked very eagerly after you and mistress isabel he tried to to inveigle me and to talk of peter his prerogative but i would not have it it was Lammas Day when I saw him, and he spoke much of it. Anthony asked whether there was anything said of what punishment Mr. Buxton would suffer. Well, said Mr. Dent, the lieutenant of the tower told me that her grace was so sad at the death of Mistress Corbett that she was determined that no more blood should be shed than was obliged over this matter, and that Mr. Buxton he thought, would be but deprived of his estates and banished. But I know not how that may be, but we shall soon know. These weeks of waiting were full of consolation and refreshment to Anthony. The nervous stress of the life of the seminary priest in England, full of apprehension and suspense, crowned, as it had been in his case, by the fierce excitement of the last days of his liberty, all this had strained and distracted his soul, and the peace of the prison life, with the certainty that no efforts of his own could help him now, quieted and strengthened him for the ordeal he foresaw. At this time, too, he used to spend two or three hours a day in meditation, and found the greatest benefit in following the tranquil method of prayer prescribed by Louis de Blois, with whose writings he had made acquaintance at Douay. Each morning, too, he said a dry mass, and during the whole of his imprisonment at the clink, managed to make his confession at least once a week, and besides his communion at mass on Sundays, communicated occasionally from the reserved sacrament which he was able to keep in a neighboring cell, unknown to his jailer. And so the days went by, as orderly as in a religious house he rose at a fixed hour observed the greatest exactness in his devotions and did his utmost to prevent any visitors being admitted to see him or any from another cell coming into his own until he had finished his first meditation and said his office and there began to fall upon him a kind of mellow peace that rose at times of communion and prayer to a point so ravishing that he began to understand that it would not be a light cross for which such preparatory graces were necessary towards the middle of september he received intelligence that evidence had been gathering against him and that one or two were come from lancashire under guard and that he would be brought before the commissioners again immediately Within two days this came about. He was sent for across the water to the tower, and after waiting an hour or two with his jailer downstairs in the basement of the white tower, was taken up into the great hall where the council sat. There was a table at the farther end where they were sitting, and as Anthony looked round he saw through openings all around in the inner wall the little passage where the sentries walked and heard their footfalls. The preliminaries of identification and the like had been disposed of at previous examinations before Mr. Young, 
a name full of sinister suggestiveness to the catholics and so after he had been given a seat at a little distance from the table behind which the commissioners sat he was questioned minutely as to his journey in the north of england what were you there for mr dorris inquired the secretary of the council i want to see friends and to do my business then that resolves itself into two heads one who are your friends two what was your business now it had been established beyond a doubt at previous examinations that he was a priest a student of douay who had apostatized had positively identified him so anthony answered boldly my friends were catholics and my business was the reconciling of souls to their creator and to the pope of rome put in wade who is christ's vicar continued anthony and a pestilent knave concluded a fiery-faced man whom anthony did not know but the commissioners wanted more than that it was true that anthony was already convicted of high treason in having been ordained beyond the seas and in exercising his priestly functions in england but the exacting of the penalty for religion alone was apt to raise popular resentment and it was far preferable in the eyes of the authorities to entangle a priest in the political net before killing him so they passed over for the present his priestly functions and first demanded a list of all the places where he had stayed in the north you ask what is impossible said anthony with his eyes on the ground and his heart beating sharply for he knew that now peril was near well said wade let us put it another way we know that you were at speak hall blainsco and other places i have a list here and he tapped the table but we want your name to it let me see the paper said anthony nay nay tell us first i cannot sign the paper except i see it said anthony smiling give it him said a voice from the end of the table here then said wade unwillingly anthony got up and took the paper from him and saw one or two places named where he had not been and saw that it had been drawn up at any rate partly on guesswork he put the paper down and went back to his chair and sat down it is not true he said looking steadily at the secretary i cannot sign it do you deny that you have been to any of these places inquired wade indignantly the paper is not true said anthony again well then show us what is not true upon it i cannot we will find means to persuade you said the secretary if god permits said anthony wade glanced round inquiringly and shrugged his shoulders one or two shook their heads well then we will turn to another point there are known to have been certain jesuit priests in lancashire in november of last year do you deny that sir you ask too much said anthony smiling again they may have been there for aught i know for i certainly did not see them elsewhere at the time you mention wade frowned but the one at the end laughed loud he has you there wade he said this is foolery said the secretary well these two father edward oldcorn and father holtby were in lancashire in november and you mr norris spoke with them then we wish to know where they are now and you must tell us you have yet to prove that i spoke with them said anthony for the trap was too transparent but we know that that may or may not be but it is for you to prove it nay for you to tell us for you to prove it wade lost his temper well then he cried 
take this paper and see which of us is in the right anthony rose again wondering what the paper could be and came towards the table he saw it bore a name at the end and as he advanced saw that it had an official appearance wade still held it but anthony took it in his hand too to steady it and began to read but as he read a mist rose before his eyes and the paper shook violently it was a warrant to put him to the torture wade laughed a little why see mr norris how you tremble at the warrant what will it be when you but a voice murmured shame and he stopped and stared anthony passed his hand over his eyes and went back to his chair and sat down he saw his knees trembling as he sat and hated himself for it but he cried bravely the flesh is weak but please god the spirit is willing well then said wade again must we execute this warrant or will you tell us what we would know you must do what god permits said anthony wade sat down throwing the warrant on the table and began to talk in a low voice to those who sat next him anthony fixed his eyes on the ground and did his utmost to keep his thoughts steady now he realized where he was and what it all meant the little door to the left behind him that he had noticed as he came in was the door of which he had heard other catholics speak that led down to the great crypt where so many before him had screamed and fainted and called on god from the rack that stood at the foot of the stairs or from the pillar with the fixed ring at its summit he had faced all this in his mind again and again but it was a different thing to have the horror within arm's length old phrases he had heard of the torture rang in his mind a boast of norton's the rack master who had racked brian and which had been repeated from mouth to mouth that he had made brian a foot longer than god made him words of james maxwell's that he had let drop at douay the remembrance of his limp and of campion's powerlessness to raise his hand when called upon to swear all these things crowded on him now and there seemed to rest on him a crushing swarm of fearful images and words he made a great effort and closed his eyes and repeated the holy name of jesus over and over again but the struggle was still fierce when wade's voice harsh and dry broke in and scattered the confusion of mind that bewildered him take the prisoner to a cell he is not to go back to the clink anthony felt a hand on his arm and the jailer was looking at him with compassion come sir he said anthony rose feeling heavy and exhausted but remembered to bow to the commissioners one or two of whom returned it then he followed the jailer out into the ante-room who handed him over to one of the tower officials i must leave you here sir he said but keep a good heart it will not be for to-day when anthony got to his new cell which was in the salt tower he was bitterly angry and disappointed with himself why he had turned white and sick like a child not at the pain of the rack not even at the sight of it but at the mere warrant he threw himself on his knees and bowed down till his head beat against the boards oh lord jesus he prayed give me of thy manhood he found that this prison was more rigorous than the clink no liberty to leave the cell could possibly be obtained and no furniture was provided the jailer when he had brought up his dinner asked whether he could send any message for him for a bed anthony gave isabel's address knowing that the authorities were already aware that she was a catholic and indeed she had given bail to come up for trial if called upon and that his information could injure neither her nor the merits who were sound church of england people and in the afternoon a mattress and some clothes arrived for him 
anthony noticed at dinner that the knife provided was of a very inconvenient shape having a round blunt point and being sharp only at a lower part of the blade and when the keeper came up with his supper he asked him to bring him another kind the man looked at him with a queer expression what is the matter asked anthony cannot you oblige me the man shook his head they are the knives that are always given to the prisoners under warrant for torture anthony did not understand him and looked at him puzzled for fear they should do themselves an injury added the jailer then the same shudder ran over his body again you mean you mean he began the jailer nodded still looking at him oddly and went out and anthony sat with his supper untasted staring before him by a kind of violent reaction he had a long happy dream that night the fierce emotions of that day had swept over his imagination and scoured it as with fire and now the underlying peace rose up and flooded it with sweetness he thought he was in the north again high up on a moor walking with one who was quite familiar to him but whose person he could not remember when he woke he did not even know whether it was man or woman it was a perfect autumn day he thought like one of those he had spent there last year the heather and the gorse were in flower and the air was redolent from their blossoms he commented on this to the person at his side who told him it was always so there mile after mile the moor rose and dipped and although skidda was on his right purple and grey yet to his left there was a long curved horizon of sparkling blue sea it was a cloudless day overhead and the air seemed kindling and fresh round him as it blew across the stretches of heather from the western sea he himself felt full of an extraordinary vitality and the mere movement of his limbs gave him joy as he went swiftly and easily forward over the heather there was the sound of the wind in his ears and again and again there came the gush of water from somewhere out of sight as he had heard it in the church by skidda there was no house or building of any kind within sight and he felt a great relief in these miles of heath and the sense of holiday that they gave him but all the joy round him and in his heart found their point for him in the person that went with him this presence was their centre as a diamond in a gold ring or as a throned figure in a court circle all else existed for the sake of this person the heather blossomed and the gorse incensed the air and the sea sparkled and the sky was blue and the air kindled and his own heart warmed and throbbed for that only when he tried to see who it was there was nothing to see the presence existed there as a centre in a sphere immeasurable and indiscernible sometimes he thought it was mary sometimes he thought it henry buxton sometimes isabel once even he assured himself it was mistress margaret and once james maxwell and with the very act of identification came indecision again this uncertainty waxed into a torment and yet a sweet torment as of a lover who watches his mistress shuttered house and this torment swelled yet higher and deeper until it was so great that it had absorbed the whole radiant fragrant circle of the hills where he walked and then came the blinding knowledge that the presence was all these persons so dear to him and far more that every tenderness and grace that he had loved in them mary's gallantry and isabel's serene silence and his friend's fellowship and the rest floated in the translucent depths of it stained and irradiated by it as motes in a sunbeam and then he woke and it was through tears of pure joy that he saw the rafters overhead and the great barred door and the discoloured wall above his bed when his jailer brought him dinner that day it was half an hour earlier than usual and when anthony asked him the reason he said that he did not know but that the orders had run so 
but that Mr. Morris might take heart, it was not for the torture. For Mr. Topcliffe, who superintended it, had told the keeper of the rack house that nothing would be wanted that day. He had hardly finished dinner when the jailer came up again and said that the lieutenant was waiting for him below and that he must bring his hat and cloak. Since his arrest he had worn his priest's habit every day, so he now threw the cloak over his arm and took his hat and followed the jailer down. In passing through the court he went by a group of men that were talking together, and he noticed very especially a tall old man with a grey head in a court suit with a sword, and very lean about the throat, who looked at him hard as he passed. As he reached the archway where the lieutenant was waiting, he turned again and saw the sunken eyes of the old man still looking after him. When he turned to the jailer, he saw the same odd look in his face that he had noticed before. "'Why do you look like that?' he asked. "'Who is that old man?' that is mr topcliffe said the keeper the lieutenant of the tower sir richard barclay saluted him kindly at the gate and begged him to follow him the keeper still came after and another stepped out and joined them and the group of four together passed out through the lion's tower and across the moat to a little doorway where a closed carriage was waiting the lieutenant and Anthony stepped inside, the two keepers mounted outside, and the carriage set off. Then the lieutenant turned to the priest. "'Do you know where you are going, Mr. Norris?' "'No, sir. You are going to Whitehall to see the Queen's Grace.'" End of chapter 13part three chapter fourteen of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain an open door when the carriage reached the palace they were told that the queen was not yet come from greenwich and they were shown into a little ante-room next to the gallery where the interview was to take place the queen the lieutenant told anthony was to come up that afternoon passing through london and that she had desired to see him on her way through to nonsuch he could not tell him why he was sent for though he conjectured it was because of mistress corbett's death and that her grace wished to know the details however said the lieutenant you now have your opportunity to speak for yourself and i think you a very fortunate man mr norris few have had such a privilege though i remember that mr campion had it too though he made poor use of it anthony said nothing his mind was throbbing with memories and associations the air of state and luxury in the corridors through which he had just come the discreet guarded doors the servants in the royal liveries standing here and there the sense of expectancy that mingled with the solemn hush of the palace all served to bring up the figure of mary corbett whom he had seen so often in these circumstances and the thought of her made the peril in which he stood and the hope of escape from it seem very secondary matters he walked to the window presently and looked out upon the little court below one of the innumerable yards of that vast palace and stood staring down on the hound that was chained there near one of the entrances and that yawned and blinked in the autumn sunshine even as he looked the dog paused in the middle of his stretch and stood expectant with his ears cocked a servant dashed bareheaded down a couple of steps and out through the low archway and simultaneously anthony heard once more the sweet shrill trumpets that told of the queen's approach then there came the roll of drums and the thunder of horses feet and the noise of wheels the trumpets sang out again nearer and the rumbling waxed louder as the queen's cavalcade out of sight past the entrance of the archway down upon which anthony looked and then stilled and the palace itself began to hum and stir a door or two banged in the distance 
feet ran past the door of the anteroom and the strain of the trumpets sounded once in the house itself then all grew quiet once more and anthony turned from the window and sat down again by the lieutenant there was silence for a few minutes the lieutenant stroked his beard gently and said a word or two under his breath now and again to anthony once or twice there came the swift rustle of a dress outside as a lady hurried past then the sound of a door opening and shutting then more silence then the sound of low talking and at last the sound of footsteps going slowly up and down the gallery which adjoined the anteroom still the minutes passed but no summons came anthony rose and went to the window again for in spite of himself this waiting told upon him the dog had gone back to his kennel and was lying with his nose just outside the opening anthony wondered vacantly to himself what door it was that he was guarding and who lived in the rooms that looked out beside it then suddenly the door from the gallery opened and a page appeared the queen's grace will see mr norris alone anthony went towards him and the page opened the door wide for him to go through and then closed it noiselessly behind him and anthony was in the presence it was with a sudden bewilderment that he recognized he was in the same gallery as that in which he had talked and sat with mary corbett there were the long tapestries hanging opposite him with the tall three windows dividing them and the suits of steel armor that he remembered he even recalled the pattern of the carpet across which mary corbett had come forward to meet him and that still lay before the tall window at the end that looked on to the tilt-yard the sun was passing round to the west now and shone again across the golden haze of the yard through this great window with the fragments of stained glass at the top the memory leaped into life even as he stepped out and stood for a moment dazed in the sunshine at the door that opened from the anteroom but the figure that turned from the window and faced him was not like mary's it was the figure of an old woman who looked tall with her towering headdress and nodding plume she was dressed in a great dark red mantle thrown back on her shoulders and beneath it was a pale yellow dress sewn all over with queer devices on the puffed sleeve of the arm that held the stick was embroidered a great curling snake that shone with gold thread and jewels in the sunlight and powdered over the skirt were representations of human eyes and other devices embroidered with dark thread that showed up plainly on the pale ground so much he saw down one side of the figure on which the light shone the rest was to his dazzled eyes in dark shadow he went down on his knees at once before this tremendous figure seeing the buckled feet that twinkled below the skirt cut short in front and remained there there was complete silence for a moment while he felt the queen looking at him and then the voice he remembered only older and harsher now said what is all this mr norris anthony looked for a moment and saw the queen's eyes fixed on him but he said nothing and looked down again stand up said the queen not unkindly and walk with me anthony stood up at once and heard the stiff rustle of her dress and the tap of her heels and stick on the polished boards as she came towards him then he turned with her down the long gallery until this moment ever since he had heard that he was to see the queen he had felt nervous and miserable but now this had left him and he felt at his ease to be received in this way in privacy and to accompany her up and down the gallery as she took her afternoon exercise was less embarrassing than the formal interview he had expected the two walked the whole length of the gallery without a word and it was not until they turned and faced the end that looked on to the tilt-yard that the queen spoke and her voice was almost tender i understand that you were with minnie corbett when she died she said she died for me your grace said anthony the queen looked at him sharply tell me the tale she said 
and anthony told her the whole story of the escape and the ride speaking too for his friend mr buxton and of mary's affection for him your grace he ended it sounds a poor tale of a man that a woman should die for him so but i can say with truth that with god's grace i would have died a hundred deaths to save her the queen was silent for a good while when the story was over and anthony thought that perhaps she could not speak but he dared not look at her then she spoke very harshly and you mr norris why did you not escape your grace would not have done so when i saw that she was dying i would not if you had been a priest your grace what is that asked the queen suddenly facing him i am a priest madam and she was a catholic and my duty was beside her eh i shrived her your grace before she died why they did not tell me that anthony was silent they walked on a few steps and the queen stood silent too looking down upon the tilt-yard then she turned abruptly and anthony turned with her and they began to go up and down again it was gallant of you both she said shortly i love that my people should be of that sort then she paused tell me she went on did mary love me anthony was silent for a moment the truth mr norris she said mistress corbett was loyalty itself he answered nay 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 not loyalty but love i asked you of how did she speak of me well your grace mistress corbett had a shrewd wit and she used it freely on friend and foe but her very sharpness on your grace sometimes showed her love for she hated to think you otherwise than what she deemed the best the queen stopped full in her walk that is very pleasantly put she said i told minnie you were a courtier again the two walked on then she used her tongue on me your grace i have never met one on whom she did not but her heart was true i know that mr norris tell me something she said anthony racked his brains for something not too severe mistress corbett once said that the queen's most disobedient subject was herself eh said elizabeth stopping in her walk because said mistress corbett she can never command herself finished anthony the queen looked at anthony puzzled a moment and then chuckled loudly in her throat the impertinent minx she said that was when i had clouted her no doubt again they walked up and down in silence a little while anthony began to wonder whether this was all for which the queen had sent for him he was astonished at his own self-possession all the trembling awe with which he had faced the queen at greenwich was gone he had forgotten for the moment even his own peril and he felt instead even something of pity for this passionate old woman who had aged so quickly whose favourites one by one were dropping off or at the best giving her only an exaggerated and ridiculous devotion at the absurdity of which all the world laughed here was this old creature at his side surrounded by flatterers and adventurers advancing through the world in splendid and jewelled raiment with trumpets blowing before her and poets singing her praises and crowds applauding in the streets and sneering in their own houses at the withered old virgin queen who still thought herself a diana and all the while this triumphal progress was at the expense of god's church her car rolled over the bodies of his servants and her shrunken gemmed fingers were red in their blood so she advanced thought anthony day by day towards the black truth and the eternal loneliness of the darkness that lies outside the realm where christ only is king elizabeth broke in suddenly on his thoughts now she said 
and what of you, Mr. Norris? I am your grace's servant, he said. I am not so sure of that, said Elizabeth. If you are my servant, why are you a priest, contrary to my laws? Because I am Christ's servant too, your grace. But Christ's apostle said, Obey them that have the rule over you. In indifferent matters, madam. The queen frowned and made a little angry sound. Oh, I cannot understand you papists, said the queen. What a God's name do you want? You have liberty of thought and faith. I desire to inquire into no man's private opinions. You may worship Ashtaroth, if it please you in your own hearts. And God looks to the heart and not to the outer man. There is a church with bishops like your own and ministers. There are the old churches to worship in. Nay, you may find the old ornaments still in use. We have sacraments, as you have. You may seek shrift, if you will. Nay, in some manner we have the Mass, though we do not call it so. But we follow Christ's ordinance in the matter, and you can do no more. We have the Word of God, as you have, and we use the same creeds. What more can the rankest papist ask? Tell me that, Mr. Norris, for I am a weary of your folk. The queen turned and faced him again a moment, and her eyes were peevish and resentful. Presently she went on again. Mr. Campion told me it was the oath that troubled him. He could not take it, he said. I told the fool that I was not head of the church as Christ was, but only the supreme governor as the act declares in all spiritual and ecclesiastical things i forget how it runs but i showed it him and asked him whether it were not true and i asked him too how it was that margaret roper could take the oath and so many thousands of persons as full christian as himself and he could not answer me the queen was silent again then once more she went on indignantly it is yourselves that have brought all this trouble on your heads. See what the papists have done against me. They have excommunicated me, deposed me, though in spite of it I still sit on the throne. They have sent an armada against me. They have plotted against me, I know not how many times. And then when i defend myself and hang a few of the wolves lo they are christ's flock at once for whom he shed his precious blood and his persecuted lambs and i am jezebel straightway and athaliah and baalzebub's wife and i know not what the queen stopped out of breath and looked fiercely at anthony who said nothing tell me how you answer that mr norris said the queen i dare not deal with such great matters said anthony for your grace knows well that i am but a poor priest that knows naught of statecraft but i would like to ask your highness two questions only the first is whether your grace had aught to complain of in the conduct of your catholic subjects when the armada was here and the second whether there hath been one actual attempt upon your grace's life by private persons that is not to the purpose said the queen peevishly it was catholics who fought against me in the armada and it was catholics who plotted against me at court then there is a difference in catholics your grace said anthony ah i see what you would be at yes your highness i would rather say although they be catholics they do these things there was silence again which anthony did not dare to break and the two walked up the whole length of the gallery without speaking well well said elizabeth at last but this was not why i sent for you 
we will speak of yourself now mr norris i hope you are not an obstinate fellow eh anthony said nothing and the queen went on now as i have told you i judge no man's private opinions you may believe what you will remember that you may believe what you will nay you may practise your religion so long as it is private and unknown to me anthony began to wonder what was coming but he still said nothing as the queen paused she stood a moment looking down into the empty tilt-yard again and then turned and sat suddenly in a chair that stood beside the window and put up a jewelled hand to shield her face with her elbow on the arm while anthony stood before her i remember you mr norris very well at greenwich you spoke up sharply enough and you looked me in the eyes now and then as i like a man to do and then minnie loved you too i wish to show you kindness for her sake anthony's heart began to fail him for he guessed now what was coming and the bitter struggle that lay before him now i know well that the commissioners have had you before them they are tiresome busybodies walsingham started all that and set them a spying and a defending of my person and the rest of it but they are loyal folk and i suppose they asked you where you had been and with whom you had stayed and so on they did your grace and you would not tell them i suppose i could not madam it would have been against justice and charity to do so well well there is no need now for i mean to take you out of their hands a great leap of hope made itself felt in anthony's heart he did not know how heavy the apprehension lay on him till this light shone through they will be wroth with me i know and will tell me that they cannot defend me if i will not help them but when all is said i am queen now i do not ask you to be a minister of my church for that i think you would never be but i think you would like to be near me is it not so and i wish you to have some post about the court i must see what it is to be anthony's heart began to sink again as he watched the queen's face as she sat tapping a foot softly and looking on the floor as she talked those lines of self-will about the eyes and mouth surely meant something then she looked up still with her cheek on her right hand you do not thank me mr norris anthony made a great effort but he heard his own voice quiver a little i thank your grace for your kindly intentions toward me with all my heart the queen seemed satisfied and looked down again as to the oath i will not ask you to take it formally if you will give me an assurance of your loyalty that your grace i give most gladly his heart was beating again in great irregular thumps in his throat he had the sensation of swaying to and fro on the edge of a precipice now towards safety and now towards death it was the cruelest pain he had suffered yet but how was it possible to have some post at court without relinquishing the exercise of his priesthood he must think it out what did the queen mean and of course you will not be able to say mass again but i shall not hinder your hearing it at the ambassador's whenever you please ah it had come his heart gave a leap and seemed to cease your grace must forgive me but i cannot consent there was a dead silence when anthony looked up she was staring at him with the frankest astonishment did you think mr norris you could be at court and say mass too whenever you wished her voice rang harsh and shrill her anger was rising i was not sure what your grace intended for me the fellow is mad she said still staring at him oh take care take care your grace knows i intend no insolence 
you mean to say mr norris that you will not take a pardon and a post at court on those terms anthony bowed he could not trust himself to speak so bitter was the reaction but see man you fool if you die as a traitor you will never say mass again either but that will not be with my consent your grace and you refuse the pardon on those terms your grace i must well and she was silent a moment you are a fool sir anthony bowed again but i like courage well then you will not be my servant i have ever been that your grace and ever will be well well but not at court ah your grace knows i cannot cried anthony and his voice rang sorrowfully again there was silence you must have your way sir for poor minnie's sake but it passes my understanding what you mean by it and let me tell you that not many have their way with me rather than mine again hope leaped up in his heart the queen then was not so ungracious he looked up and smiled and down again why the man's lips are all a quiver what ails him it is your grace's kindness i must say i marvel at it myself observed elizabeth you near angered me just now take care you do not so quite i would not willingly as your grace knows then we will end this matter you give me your assurance of loyalty to my person with all my heart madam said anthony eagerly then you must get to france within the week the other too buxton he loses his estate but has his life i am doing much for minnie's sake how can i thank your grace and i will cause sir richard to give it out that you have taken the oath call him in there was a quick gasp from the priest and then he cried with agony in his voice i cannot your grace i cannot cannot call sir richard why are you mad sir cannot consent i have taken no oath i know you have not i do not ask it elizabeth's voice came short and harsh her patience was vanishing and anthony knew it and looked at her she had dropped her hand and it was clinching and unclinching on her knee her stick slipped on the polished boards and fell but she paid it no attention she was looking straight at the priest her high eyebrows were coming down her mouth was beginning to mumble a little he could see in the clear sunlight that fell on her sideways through the tall windows a thousand little wrinkles and all seemed alive the lines at the corners of her eyes and mouth deepened as he watched what a christ's name do you want sir it was like the first mutter of a storm on the horizon but anthony knew it must break he did not answer tell me sir what is it now anthony drew a long breath and braced his will but even as he spoke he knew he was pronouncing his own sentence i cannot consent to leave the country and let it be given out that i had taken the oath your grace it would be an apostasy from my faith elizabeth sprang to her feet without her stick took one step forward and gave anthony a fierce blow on the cheek with her ringed hand he recoiled a step at the shock of it and stood waiting with his eyes on the ground then the queen's anger poured out in words her eyes burned with passion out of an ivory-coloured face and her voice rang high and harsh and her hands continually clenched and unclenched as she screamed at him god's body you are the ungratefulest hound that ever drew breath i send for you to my presence and talk and walk with you like a friend i offer you a pardon and you fling it in my face i offer you a post at court and you mock it you flaunt you in your treasonable livery in my very face and laugh at my clemency you think i am no queen but a weak woman whom you can turn and rule at your will god's son i will show you which is sovereign call sir richard in sir i will have him in this instant sir richard sir richard 
she screamed stamping with fury the door into the ante-room behind opened and sir richard barclay appeared with a face full of apprehension he knelt at once stand up sir richard she cried and look at this man you know him do you not and i know him now the insolent dog but his own mother shall not in a week look at him shaking there the knave he will shake more before i have done with him take him back with you sir richard and let them have their will of him his damned pride and insolence shall be broken spotty i have never been so treated take him out sir richard take him out i tell you end of chapter fourteen part three chapter fifteen of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain the rolling of the stone it was a week later and a little before dawn that isabel was kneeling by anthony's bed in his room in the tower the lieutenant had sent for her to his lodging the evening before and she had spent the whole night with her brother he had been racked four times in one week and was dying the city and the prison were very quiet now the carts had not yet begun to roll over the cobblestones and the last night wanderers had gone home he lay on the mattress that she had sent in to him in the corner of his cell under the window on his back and very still covered from chin to feet with her own fur-lined cloak that she had thrown over him his head was on a low pillow for he could not bear to lie high his feet made a little mound under the coverlet and his arms lay straight at his side but all that could be seen of him was his face pinched and white now with hollows in his cheeks and dark patches and lines beneath his closed eyes and his soft pointed brown beard that just rested on the fur edging of isabel's cloak his lips were drawn tight but slightly parted showing the rim of his white teeth as if he snarled with pain the only furniture in the room was a single table and chair the table was drawn up not far from the bed and a book or two with a flask of cordial and some fragments of food on a plate lay upon it his cloak and doublet and ruff lay across the chair and his shoes below it and a little linen lay in a pile in another corner but the clothes in which he had been tortured the evening before his shirt and hose could not be taken off him and he lay in them still they had been so soaked with sweat that isabel had found him shivering and laid her cloak over him and now he lay quiet and warm earlier in the night she had been reading to him and a taper still burned in a candlestick on the table but for the last two hours he had lain either in a sleep or a swoon and she had laid the book down and was watching him he was so motionless that he would have seemed dead except for the steady rise and fall of a fold in the mantle and for a sudden muscular twitch every few minutes isabel herself was scarcely less motionless her face was clear and pale as it always was but perfectly serene and even her lips did not quiver she was kneeling and leaning back now and her hands were clasped in her lap there was a proud content in her face her dear brother had not uttered one name on the rack except those of the saviour and of the blessed mother so the lieutenant had told her suddenly his eyes opened and there was nothing but peace in them and his lips moved isabel leaned forward on her hands and bent her ear to his mouth till his breath was warm on it and she could hear the whisper then she opened the book that lay face down on the table and began to read on from the point at which she had laid it down two hours before erat autem ora tertia et crucifixerunt eum and it was the third hour and they crucified him 
and with him they crucify two thieves the one on his right hand and the other on his left and the scripture was fulfilled which saith and he was numbered with the transgressors her voice was slow and steady as she read the unfamiliar latin still kneeling with the book a little raised to catch the candlelight and her grave tranquil eyes bent upon it only once did her voice falter and then she commanded it again immediately and that as she read errant autem et mulieres de longe aspicientes there were also women looking on afar off and so the tale crept on minute by minute and the priest lay with closed eyes to hear it until the mocking was complete and the darkness of the sixth hour had come and gone and the saviour had cried aloud on his father and given up the ghost and the centurion that stood by had borne witness and the great criminal slept in the garden in the sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid there was a listening silence as the voice ceased without another falter isabel laid the book down and looked at him again and his eyes opened languidly he had not yet said more than single words and even now his voice was so faint that she had to put her ear close to his mouth it seemed to her that his soul had gone into some secret inner chamber of profound peace so deep that it was a long and difficult task to send a thought to the surface through his lips she could just hear him and she answered clearly and slowly as to a dazed child pausing between every word i cannot get a priest it is not allowed still his eyes bent on her what was it he said what was it then she heard and began to repeat short acts of contrition clearly and distinctly pausing between the phrases in english and his eyes closed as she began oh my jesus i am heartily sorry that i have crucified thee by my sins wash my soul in thy precious blood o oh my god i am sorry that i have displeased thee because thou art all good i hate all the sins that i have done against thy divine majesty and so phrase after phrase she went on giving him time to hear and to make an inner assent of the will and repeating also other short vocal prayers that she knew by heart and so the delicate skein of prayer rose from the altar where this morning sacrifice lay before god waiting the consummation of his acceptance presently she ended and he lay again with closed eyes and mute face then again they opened and she bent down to listen it will all be well with me she answered raising her head again mistress margaret has written from brussels i shall go there for a while yes mr buxton will take me next week he goes to normandy to his estate again his lips moved and she listened a faint flush came over her face she shook her head i do not know i think not i hope to enter religion no i have not yet determined the dower house yes i will sell it yes to hubert if he wishes it every word he whispered was such an effort that she had to pause again and again before he could make her understand and often she judged more by the movement of his lips than by any sound that came from him now and then too she lifted her handkerchief soaked in a strong violet scent and passed it over his forehead and lips she motioned with the flask of cordial once or twice but his eyes closed for a negative as she knelt and watched him her thoughts circled continually in little flights 
to the walled garden of the dower house in sunshine and anthony running across it in his brown suit with the wallflowers behind him against the old red bricks and ivy and the tall chestnut rising behind to the wind-swept hills with the thistles and the goldenrod and the hazel thickets and anthony on his pony sunburnt and voluble hawk on wrist with a light in his eyes to the warm panelled hall in winter with the tapers on the round table and anthony flat on his face with his feet in the air before the hearth that glowed and roared up the wide chimney behind and his chin on his hands and a book open before him or farther back even still to anthony's little room at the top of the house his clothes on a chair and the boy himself sitting up in bed with his arms round his knees as she came in to wish him good-night and talk to him a minute or two and every time the circling thought came home and settled again on the sight of that still straight figure lying on the mattress against the discoloured bricks with the light of the taper glimmering on his thin face and brown hair and beard and every time her heart consented that this was the best of all a bird chirped suddenly from some hole in the tower once and then three or four times she glanced up at the window and the light of dawn was beginning then as the minutes went by the city began to stir itself from sleep there came a hollow whine from the lion gate fifty yards away up from the river came the shout of a waterman two or three times a late cock crew and still the light crept on and broadened but anthony still lay with his eyes closed at last over the cobbles outside a cart rattled turned a corner and was silent anthony had opened his eyes now and was looking at her again and again she bent down to listen and then opened and read again et cum transiset sabatum maria magdalene et maria jacobi et salome emerunt aromata et venientes ungerent jesum and when the sabbath was past mary magdalene and mary the mother of james and salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him a slight sound made her look up anthony's eyes were kindling and his lips moved she bent again and listened what was it he said yes it was so and she smiled and nodded at him she was reading the gospel for easter day the gospel of the first mass that they had heard together on that spring morning at great keen when their lord had led them so far round by separate paths to meet one another at his altar and now they were met again here she read on et valde mane una sabatorum veniunt ad monumentum orto jam sole very early they came into the sepulchre at the rising of the sun and they said among themselves who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre and when they looked they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great manus valde read isabel and looked up again and then closed the book there was no need to read more she walked across the court half an hour later just as the sun came up and passed out through the lieutenant's lodging and out by the narrow bridge on to the tower wharf to the left and behind her as she looked eastwards down the river lay the heavy masses of the prison she had left and the high walls and turrets were gilded with glory the broad river itself was one rolling glory too the tide was coming in swift and strong and a barge or two moved upwards only half seen in the bewildering path of the sun the air was cool and keen and a breeze from the water stirred isabel's hair as she stood looking with the light on her face it was a cloudless october morning overhead even as she stood a flock of pigeons streamed across from the south side swift flying and bathed in light 
and her eyes followed them a moment or two. As she stood there silent, a step came up the wharf from the direction of St. Catherine Street, and a man came walking quickly towards her. He did not see who she was until he was close, and then he started and took off his hat. It was Lackington, on his way to some business at the tower. But she did not seem to see him. She turned almost immediately and began to walk westwards, and the glory in her eyes was supreme, and as she went the day deepened above her. End of Part 3 Chapter 15 End of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson Recording by Carol Pelster